welcome to Good Game, the show for gamers by gamers. I'm Bajo. And I'm Hex. This week we'll be gaming from the small screen all the way to the big screen, starting with an umbear <laughs> and ridiculous fishing. Plus the experience magnifique with Bientolete. <laughs> Cooperative destructive mayhem, an army of two, the Devil's Cartel. Elf and Bravo reaching rally point. We're gonna hold. And Goose saddles up to find out how the Wild West was tamed in our latest backwards compatible. But first, can you guess the game for this week? Well, Hex, go up and read the news. Time to settle up and. Yeah, more of that awesome acting later. Just a trail. Good game. Disney has closed down LucasArts. Approximately 150 people were laid off, while the promising Star Wars 1313 and Star Wars First Assault games were cancelled. Disney has stated that those projects could potentially be licensed out to other studios, but according to various sources, this is unlikely to happen. The LucasArts brand will now shift from internal development and instead focus on licensing out projects to external developers. But here, have this complimentary mug. Sega has announced that their Australian studio will be closed down later this year. The studio was responsible for games including Medieval 2 Total War, the London 2012 game and Stormrise. Meanwhile, Sega also announced that the Wii U version of Aliens Colonial Marines has been cancelled. Publisher Electronic Arts has earned the dubious honour of being voted the worst company in America for the second year in a row by consumer advocacy website Consumerist. EA's chief operating officer Peter Moore admitted that the company had made mistakes such as poor pricing models and the bungled launch of SimCity. However, he also defended the company, saying many of the votes had come from conservative organisations, urging people to vote against EA due to their lesbian, gay, bi and transgender friendly policies, adding that if such policies would make them the worst company, then bring it on. Microsoft's creative director Adam Orth caused quite a stir on Twitter recently. Amid growing rumours that Microsoft's new console would require an always online internet connection to work, Orth took to the social networking site to say he didn't understand the drama around such a move and that every device is now always on, followed by the hashtag deal with it. Microsoft then apologised for his inappropriate remarks. First up in our mobile roundup, we're looking at Penumbra, a super stylish platformer that's all about walking on rays of light. That first time I made my leap of faith onto a light bridge, I was pretty hesitant, but before long it becomes second nature. But just as you get used to the light walking mechanic, the game ratchets up the puzzles. Often there's a bit of backtracking involved as you find a light switch and then use the beam to get the key that you need. You can even use light as a weapon to vaporise your enemies in some stages. How did you find the puzzles, Hex? Well, I thought they were quite clever, especially the ones where you had to deactivate light blocks in the middle of a jump. I just thought the game's fiddly controls undermined its potential a little bit. On this level, you need to ride a light elevator, but the size of the platform is absolutely tiny, which made it frustratingly easy to slip off. Yeah, it's pretty unforgiving, and I felt like turning the game off at that point. These moths knock you off to your death if they touch you. You can draw them away by turning on a light, but even after you've done that, they still get in your way and cause me a handful of what I thought were unfair deaths. It's like the designers thought that just having a straight, simple solution to this puzzle would be too easy. Yeah, and it's a shame because there are so many other areas this game excels in. The sound design, for example, is some of the best I've heard on a smartphone. The music is a thoughtful and moody mix of tunes that suit the puzzles perfectly, and even simple things like pushing stone blocks around have real texture in their audio. It's not a perfect game, but I was prepared to overlook the frustrations and just enjoy this cerebral journey, so it was a 7 from me. I find fiddly controls on smartphone and touchscreen games so frustrating, so I can only give it a 5. Next up, Ridiculous Fishing. It's time to give your brain a rest and focus on those twitch reflexes. The premise is super simple. You dodge the fish as your hook is sinking, so you can get as deep as possible. On the way back up, it's the reverse, because you want to hook as many fish as you can. At this point, you've already got a pretty good game, but then you get to do this. 
Shooting the fish down is the perfect minigame punchline. Yeah, it sure beats a minigame about cleaning them and then cooking them, blah. Uh, but there is hidden depth everywhere in this game. You can add gadgets to your hook to electrocute the fish, but it's hard to beat the chainsaw attachment so you can mow right through them. These add-ons might sound cruel, but they're essential if you're going to be able to get deep enough to find the rare species that lurk at the bottom. And some of these fish are crazy to catch, such as the ones that only appear at certain times of the day. Whenever I wanted to bag a specific fish, I'd find myself actively avoiding all of the others on the way back up, so I didn't have unnecessary extras to shoot. And then I'd use a heavier weapon like the shotgun to stack my odds even more. I like that there's a bit to think about with this. Oh, there's just so many reasons to love this game. The art design is as quirky as they come, and there are countless clever touches, like the way the music rolls backwards as you reel back your line. Plus, there's no microtransactions at all. I'd almost forgotten what that was like to play a game and unlock everything without being asked to fork over extra cash. This is a fantastic game. You could say, I'm hooked. Oh. I'm going to give it 9 out of 10 rubber chickens. I'm giving it 9 as well. It wasn't the first game that I played, obviously, but the, the first game that I love is Gabriel Knight 1 on PC. Uh, that was amazing. Uh, it just like, it's just amazing storytelling and just like to have this, this New Orleans feeling with the, the voodoo cults and this, this old like underground conspiracy going on. I really felt like it was, I was reliving, like it was the same intensity as a, as a movie or a, a really good book. And at the time, the, I the graphics were amazing, even though they were like 16 bits, uh, 256 color kind of thing, but uh, the mood was, was awesome. And it, that's, that's really brought me into, um, like serious gaming, if you want. Like pre previous to that, I was playing on a Nintendo to like Super Mario. It was more of like a sort of an entertainment kind of thing. But I, this is the first time I kind of realized that you can tell amazing stories with games. Good game. Well, it's time now for our latest jaunt into the video games as art genre with the existential French title Bientôt l'été, which means soon, the summer. As soon as I booted this game up, Bajo, I knew you were going to love it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we begin in space. I do like space. We are informed that this is not a game to be won. There is no goal. There is no story. Simply allow the atmosphere to embrace you. Do not think. Do not want. Just be. Oh, come on. Shh. Bientolete. You begin the game by choosing an avatar and you're given the choice of a man or boobs. Then you arrive on a beach. Hex, I put my cynicism aside and follow the game's instructions to walk and to not think and just to be. Once you reach the waves, you can't actually walk any further, however, but a series of nondescript statements will rise and fall from the ocean, like whispers that fall like waves on the shores of your memory. Yeah, you're not really sure if this is one of those games where you're supposed to wait for something bigger to happen or if that's just it. The controls are a little awkward to use. You can navigate with the arrow keys or by moving the mouse to the left and right edges of the screen, which is a bit annoying. Hitting the scroll wheel will take you into a weird kind of dimension where you can move quite quickly. The only other object that you can see around you is a house, so you move towards it. Once inside, you take a seat at a table with a chessboard and the very French accessories of a glass of wine and a cigarette. And this is where you're supposed to have an interaction with another real-life player as part of the experience. Yes, unsurprisingly, not a huge amount of people are playing Biento Leite, so we could never seem to get a date. But there is the option to converse with an AI partner. You do this by selecting chess pieces and placing them on the board, corresponding with whichever wistful and disconnected statement you want to make. Click the wine to drink it. Click the cigarette to smoke it. Do not think. Do not want. Just be. It's a shame we couldn't find a stranger to play this game with because I think this is a game about interactions and relationships and I think that's what the game hinges on. Yeah, from what I read in the developer's blog, which is a whole journey into art and existentialism in itself, is it's meant to be a game about the complications that exist within all relationships. And then the sci-fi element to it is meant to represent a simulation that prepares a person for the loneliness of space travel. 
Upon leaving the house, it has changed, and you'll notice a new object in the environment along with another chess piece to add to your collection. And this action is repeated each time you enter and leave the house. All while being faced with the same poignant lines of dialogue, it's almost summer, you have returned. Maybe you will not come again. It's so hard to take it seriously, isn't it? Because it's almost a parody of itself. Vous touchez le corps. It just seems like such an artsy genre cliché that part of me almost thought it was a joke. Je chasse l'image de votre corps perdu dans les ténèbres de la mer. That said, if I came across this in a modern art exhibition somewhere in a gallery, I wouldn't be at all surprised. I don't think I'd be any more receptive to it, but uh, this is definitely the most art-focused game I've come across in terms of trying to create an identifiably artistic experience. I appreciate that it lets you do something other than just walk, but as hard as I tried to experience and feel something with this game, all I felt was comedy, because I just think it's a bit silly, and it made me laugh for the wrong reasons. And I'm not sure if having a real-life person there controlling these repetitive and seemingly pointless lines of dialogue that you get to read at that chess table would have made much of a difference. Yeah, and the one time I thought things were going to get interesting was after about six or seven rounds of chess and random beach object encounters, instead of a chess piece on the ground, I picked up a gun. I mean, I thought to myself, okay, here's where things could get intense. I mean, what does the gun mean? What is it for? But you can't really do anything with the gun at the chess table except put it on the chessboard. I mean, I'm not saying I want to go on a killing spree with it. I'm just saying, why give me a gun if... <gasps> Maybe that's the meaning of the game. Give a gamer a gun and they immediately want to shoot something with it. Je n'aurais pas dû manger ce quatrième sandwich au fromage. Well, anyway, I think as far as art games go, this definitely succeeds at making you think. And it does create some sort of experience rather than just letting you walk through a pretty environment. But the experience is rather dull and frustrating and repetitive. I think it's stupid. I don't think it's got enough direction in there for any gamer to sit down and actually be pulled along and have some sort of experience worth remembering, so I'm giving it two. It's three and a half for me. C'est curieux, je n'ai pas envie de rentrer. genre has been around for over 200 years, so it's not surprising that it inspired one of the very first video games. The Oregon Trail was created by three American school teachers back in 1971. In contrast to today's crop of cowboy shooters, it cast players as a wagon leader, guiding settlers safely from Missouri to Oregon. The game was designed to teach students about history while they played. Howdy, partner, what can I get you? I'm here about the bounty. Well, if your mind's made up, he's over there. <laughs> but dying ain't much of a living, boy. Before it was the console developer we know today, Nintendo was in the arcade business, and they made a pair of westerns in the 70s. The first was Wild Gunman, a quick draw game that used a light gun and live action footage of actors. Years later, it would evolve to replace the actors with cartoon sprites, before eventually being ported to the NES. The arcade version even made a famous cameo in a certain time-travelling film series. Nintendo's second release was Sheriff, an arcade shooter that used two joysticks. It was also one of the first games to feature art from none other than the legendary designer Shigeru Miyamoto. The next Wild West adventure to hit the arcades was Gunsmoke, which added cowboys to the already popular scrolling shooter genre. Sunset Riders up the size of your posse with four playable characters and loads of bull. Then Blood Brothers combined the shooting gallery with some nifty dive rolls, and of course the best level completion dance in history. Thanks for your time, little lady. <laughs> hey! I ain't done with that! 
That ain't no way to speak to a lady, Pilgrim. Ain't nobody calls me Pilgrim, especially not some dooted up egg sucking gutter trash. I don't think I introduced myself properly. People around here call me O'Shea. Rick O'Shea. Unfortunately, the biggest hangover from 80s shooters was full motion video. Howdy, stranger. We need your help. Mad Dog McCree led the charge with a light gun game that trotted out all the usual Western cliches. It was heavy on trial and error, but light on gameplay. Plus, the acting was worse than some of those first spaghetti Western films. Be careful, that's Mad Dog's boys over there. You're a dead man, O'Shea! Come on, gang, let's make like a tree and get out of here. Terribly sorry about the mess, ma'am. This, uh, ought to cover it? Touché, Ricochet. The 90s was the decade where innovation finally arrived in the Wild West, often resulting in games that turned the Western setting on its head by combining them with something unexpected. Afternoon. Let's call these Bizarro Westerns. Wild Guns on the Super NES took gameplay inspiration from Blood Brothers and added a dash of robots for a steampunk-inspired tale of revenge. Alone in the Dark 3 introduced us to the horror western, complete with zombie cowboys and possessed animals. It delivered on atmosphere, but the slow pace left the saloon door open for other horror games that had far better action. And that's exactly what the aptly titled Blood delivered. The pixelated gore and lumbering enemies were actually pretty intense. So much so that you spent most of the game hightailing it backwards while shooting just to save your skin. One of the weirdest Western shooters was Wild Arms. It was a classic tale of an innocent farm boy seeking adventure, except the Japanese RPG influence meant this boy was also a dream chaser who used magic to fight demons. Despite the odd mix of genres, the game's accomplished 3D battles and clever puzzles made this the start of a popular new franchise. But one of my favourite Bizarro Westerns has to be Oddworld, Stranger's Wrath. Taking the bizarre creature design from the same world that spawned Abe's Odyssey and slapping a western coat of paint on it resulted in a surprisingly entertaining adventure starring a bounty hunting lion who used cute little creatures as ammo in his crossbow. Hey O'Shea! I'm calling you out! Are you ready to meet your maker, boy? One of the first modern traditional westerns was Dead Man's Hand. That hurts. It delivered plenty of classic western themes like saloon shootouts and gun battles from horseback. However, the genre didn't really wear in its boots until a couple of years later with the call of Juarez. In it, you could play as an Indian who packed a bow and arrow, a unique gameplay feature back then, not so much today. You got to also play as a preacher who dealt justice with his Bible and his six-shooter. This double-barreled approach meant a lot of variety for Western fans. But the real hero of the gaming Western was the third-person genre. In 2004, Red Dead Revolver brought these games into the spotlight with its atmospheric love letter to spaghetti Westerns. The graphics were a bit dusty, but it hit all the right targets. Big characters, classic shootout locales, and clever use of slow motion to emphasise its jewels. A year later, the West got its biggest adventure yet, with Gun. Players were let loose on a large open world that featured all of the Western hallmarks, like gun slinging and horse riding, from hunting to poker playing. But the game that outgunned Gun and gave us our best Western adventure yet was Red Dead Redemption. Rockstar took its Grand Theft Auto formula and transplanted it into the desert masterfully. The cornerstone of any Western is the gunfights, and they've never been more authentic than these. Plus, the cast was full of memorable stars. Extra hardware fitted to my old Trojan horse here. You, you what? Yeah. 
but the real hero was the West itself. It looked breathtakingly amazing, and despite it being set in a desert, they somehow managed to design interesting gameplay around every corner. This was a world where any wannabe cowboy could get lost in for weeks. He didn't have enough steel for the job. Good game. Thanks, Goose. Army of Two, the Devil's Cartel, is pretty much what you expect. Two dudes shooting up other dudes, but this time, with the Frostbite 2 engine under the hood, they also shoot up everything else. Cartel is a cooperative shooter, and you're part of the organization known as Two. All clear from here. The game begins protecting a politician in a convoy down the dusty streets of Mexico. The less action we see today, the better. Naturally, it all goes wrong, and throughout the rest of the game, you'll be fighting an evil cartel through a series of pretty solid set pieces. Before that, though, you're thrust back in time five years to go through one of those familiar and unskippable training missions. This one's easy enough. Just shoot the target. I hate those. I know how to fire digital guns. I have played games before. Yeah, I know. I mean, I guess it does refresh a pretty solid aggro and cover mechanic, which is particularly useful when there's turrets involved. And I do like that aggro mechanic. I never got tired of it. It's simple, but it works with the theme of Army of Two, which is teamwork. By keeping the enemy's attention, the other player, or AI partner if you play alone, will push forwards until someone is close enough to take the turret down. Grenade out! Mountain machine gun down! It's not all about turrets, though. The gameplay in this Army 2 is actually quite diverse. There is a lot of stop and pop, but you'll also be displaced a fair bit by grenades and have the odd melee charger who thinks it's a great idea to run headfirst into two heavily armoured and armed mercenaries with a machete. There's also quite a few sections where you get split up from your teammate. And while these can be a bit frustrating if your teammate isn't very good and you have to keep doing it over and over again, it certainly mixes up the action and it adds a lot of threat to death, too. <sighs> I expected to feel like I played this game a million times before, but it didn't really feel like that to me. You know, it rocks along. Does it though? I mean, so many of those clear the area sections really overstayed their welcome, I thought. And often the last goon you have to take down is hiding somewhere, so you spend ages walking around trying to get them to shoot you and give away their positions so that you can find them and then take them out and move on. Yeah, I'm with you on that. That's a pet peeve of mine. As for those sections where you've got the, the waves of goons just coming and coming, I, I was kind of all right with that because this isn't a Call of Duty or Modern Warfare game. This is more like a, a buddy shooter where those kind of sections are common and it's a challenge and then you just move past it. Just don't compare it to games that are actually good and you'll have a good time. Exactly. <laughs> if you think of the enemies as more like an army of clones and, and they, they just keep on coming, you know, they come in waves and they're not very bright, uh, it helps you get through the game, but it also helps you realise... You know, all this slaughtering, it helps you digest it a bit easier. I feel like you're placing a lot of conditions on this playing experience. <laughs> yeah, you have to role play a you little need to, bit. You need to say, don't think, don't want, yeah. just be. Just enjoy. <laughs> you also have to ignore all the dialogue. I mean, these are soldiers with a peculiar set of morals. They want to fight evil and protect the most random of civilians they find in the field. We're in the middle of a goddamn cartel compound. She is innocent. It's all right. We're here to save you. And it is good that the devs have tried to make them heroic, but any attempt to show some humanity is completely destroyed by all the joking and the laughing right after these brutal murders. Nice. You've done well, kids. <laughs> and the constant stream of bad jokes doesn't help either. Oh, yeah! Time to die! Yeah, they didn't quite get the tone right, and uh, some of the performances are quite good, though, and the motion cap is fine. The last time we saw you, you were... The last time you saw me was five years ago. Uh, what do you know? 
There are some technical flaws though. Most of the in-game cutscenes lag and shudder, demanding more power than they're given, and it feels like every second breach or door opening takes a long time to load. And you and your partner do the whole wobble at the door thing, trying to figure out if it's bugged out or not. There are some exciting action sequences though. Yeah, the destruction really adds a lot. Your cover is often blown away. And when you fill up your kill meter, you can unleash hell with infinite ammo and invincibility. It's not an I win button. Enemies are still very much a threat when it's over, but it gives you a break. We have to find a way past this wall. Maybe you could go over there and show them some leg. Yeah, those mayhem sections are so visually exciting too. I do feel like the game could look a lot better though if it was just a little bit more grunt. You know, maybe a PC version with some DirectX 11 lighting. Because I really like these locations and most of the effects. That fuzz when you're low on health is a bit average though. Just a poor design choice, I think. And also the HUD's often cluttered up with markers quite a bit. I do think they got the enemy armor progression right though, Bajo. As you get further in, they get tougher, but it doesn't feel ridiculous, like our favorite example of that, Uncharted. Enemy AI isn't revolutionary, but they provide a solid challenge, especially when they're only injured on the ground. This is gonna be awesome. At times, the gore can be a little bit indulgent though, such as in this section where enemies just walk into the path of your vehicle. I also noticed that the enemies which were unfortunate enough to get a gut shot would actually reveal their pulsating and throbbing organs underneath. Authentic or overkill? Mm, I'm not sure. This isn't a game that I would choose to play recreationally, to be honest. I mean, it just does so much that needs to change in shooters. and. Coming off the back of Bioshock Infinite, it was pretty hard to get excited about this. Yeah, it's kind of like having a wonderful roast dinner with Bioshock and then having a 3 a.m. kebab with <laughs> Army of Two. Both are still quite tasty, but one of them is pretty bad for you. At First Tex, I was completely on the same page with you. You know, shooters are changing and we want more out of them and this has all of those conflicting moral slaughterhouse kind of things that we're so used to seeing. But we got this girl out. We did some good today. Yeah. But then the mechanics of the game started to present themselves more clearly and I started to really enjoy the combat and, and the teamwork of the game. Make a break for the ledge on the right. Plus there are so many mods and tweaks you can do to your weapons, so it was fun working on all of those and finding one that works with you. And they all feel good and sound authentic too. I think this game has been getting a bit of a bad rap, but it's a pretty good game. And I, I, I like the way that when you first meet anyone online, you always do the standard bob up and down greeting, <laughs> often for ages. Let them take our targets. That was the plan. Make a little noise. <laughs> I mean, I think that's fair, but there was nothing in this that I could really connect with. And I can't help it if I want and expect more from a shooter now, so I'm giving it five out of 10. I'm gonna give it seven and a half out of 10 rubber chickens. Hmm. So did you guess the game for this week? It was the game adaptation of Back to the Future Part 3. Released in 91, you played through four levels loosely based on the story, including one where you collect speed logs to help the train reach 88 miles per hour, an important speed in Back to the Future lore. And we made a reference to that film in our Western BC this week, but I'm sure you spotted it. Next week, many of my favourite things come together, Hex, with Injustice, Gods Among Us. We'll also be reviewing the third-person shooter MMO Defiance, which is a multi-platform cross-media thingy that's big on ambition. Don't forget, over on Spawn Point this weekend, we have a look at the console version of Terraria and see if it's as much fun as it was on PC, which it was a lot of. Till next time, may all your games be good ones. Hex out. Bajo out. I, I enjoyed dressing up as a cowboy. Yeah, I, yeah. I enjoyed wearing a dress for like five seconds and then I was like, I want to yeah. get out of the dress. Yeah, it's a good dress. Fun fact, we're using licorice to make the spit black when people mm. are spitting it out. Mm. You know what I hate? Licorice. Licorice is great. No spitting for me. Licorice coated in dark chocolate. What? <laughs>